All right. Um, so once we begin and once we get to our uh, Q&A session, there's some echoing. Um, once we get to our Q&A session, please make sure you don't use the raise hand feature. You please use the Q&A dialogue box. That allows Johanna to be able to moderate through our questions to see which ones have been answered and which ones still need to be answered. Again, do not use the raise hand feature or the chat feature. For chat, just use, um, for chat just is just to communicate if you're having any technical issues that we may be able to help with. Um, go ahead. Uh, once again, the webinar is Centering Survivors, and I will hand you over to Johanna Turner. Hi, Johanna. Hi, Patience. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, good evening, wherever you are joining us from across the U.S. and um, perhaps somewhere else in the world. Really want to thank you for joining us in the webinar. We have quite a conversation uh, before us that we're going to have, and so I just want to introduce a little bit of the background. So our conversation this evening or today is around this question of what does it mean to center survivors, the experiences of those who have been harmed in a particular situation in the restorative justice movement today. And oftentimes this principle involves navigating some tensions, um, some contradictions, some questions, and that's what really our guests that we have uh, today with us are going to help us to wrestle with to present us with some, um, some questions um, that are old, but also to pre present us with some questions that might be new to you as we talk about this principle in our work. So, and with that, I'm gonna introduce our guests who um, have a lot to share from their, their, their varied experiences in restorative justice. So our three guests are Allison Espinoza Sechko, Kazuhaga, and Richard Smith in no particular order. And I'll go ahead and, and share a little bit with you about each of them. Allison um, is from Oakland, California, and she spent a lot of time working with young people as a teacher, a mindfulness educator, and a restorative justice practitioner. She's now the programs manager at the AHIMSA Collective, which is how I came to be connected with her and to learn about the experience and the insight that she brings to this conversation. As a part of the AHIMSA Collective, she facilitates restorative circles within Valley State Prison. She also um, brings personal experiences, experience as a survivor, particularly as a survivor of child sexual abuse. This impacted um, her in many different ways, but one way in which she especially wants to highlight it is how it, um, she came to be impacted, she and her family, by the criminal justice system. Um, as a result of these experiences and many others, Allison is, is is, is very committed to making the healing potential of restorative justice manifest on a larger scale. Uh, she studied at Pitzer College, particularly um, a degree in community healing and social engagement. I didn't even know that there was a degree in community healing and social engagement, Allison. Thank you so much for being with us. Also coming to us from Oakland, California, through the AHIMSA Collective, I'm very excited to introduce Kazu Haga. Uh, Kazu and I were just talking about some of the different uh, ways that we've been um, kind of uh, connected through uh, um, different people um, as um, bridging our, our connections with each other through the years. Um, but currently, Kazu is the, serves as the founder and coordinator of the East Point Peace Academy. They do some incredible um, peace education work, among other kinds of work. He's a trainer in kingi and nonviolence, and he teaches various aspects of nonviolence, restorative justice, and mindfulness as part of that work. And like Allison, Kazu is also a facilitator in the Ahimsa Collective's Restorative Approaches to Intimate Violence Program in Prison, which we're going to hear some about during this webinar today. He was born in Tokyo. He's been engaged in social change work since he was 17 years old. And he works to empower incarcerated communities, young people, and activists around the country, among many, many others. Thank you also, Kazu, for joining us. And, and now, certain... Um, Certainly, uh, as people say, last but certainly not least, I'm really excited to introduce to you Richard Smith. Richard it comes to us from his work at Common Justice. Um, he is an active academic activist and a healer um, with nearly two decades of experience in a, a, a really a large array of different kinds of work that informs his uh, insight in this conversation. He's currently the National Director of Healing Works, a learning collaborative 
that addressing the, the healing needs of male survivors of violence and healing works is based at the organization Common Justice in New York City. He's also one of the technical assistance leaders for the U.S. Department of Justice's National Resource Center on reaching underserved victims. He has taught criminal justice history, criminal justice history and social work courses as an adjunct professor at SUNY Empire State College, Sage College and LIU Brooklyn. He's the proud father of two sons, Caden and Kayla. Uh, and, and Richard is um, currently working on his PhD. He's a doctoral candidate at SUNY Albany School of Social Welfare. His research focuses on male survivors of childhood sexual abuse and um, his master's is in Africana Studies, his bachelor's is in sociology. And so um, definitely academically and otherwise, he, um, he definitely brings a, a large wealth of insight and expertise as all of our guests do. So I just want to welcome you so much for um, all of you to this webinar and thank you again for being a part of this conversation. And with that, I'm actually gonna turn it over to um, to uh, let's see um allison and kazoo um to begin and then after that we will hear from richard beautiful thank you johanna it's so good to be here so again my name is allison i'm uh here in berkeley california right now um to share a little bit about the ahimsa collective um um, we are basically a strong network of people who have come to who have come together to address harm in a number of different ways. So um, we work in prison, as Johanna named. We also work with survivors of intimate violence. So that could be domestic violence. It could be um, sexual harm, or in, in some cases, murder. And we also do that work through VODs, victim offender dialogues. Uh, we work with law enforcement. We also do community healing and we do trainings um, addressing a number of these things. Uh, and I guess it makes sense to maybe jump right in um, and share even a little bit more about myself um, as the questions that I think we're holding in this webinar really lie at the center of why I do the work that I do. Um, Johanna shared that I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and um, yeah so I'll just jump right in but so I come from a really big Mexican-American family um, and have had uh, the sexual harm that I experienced actually existed within a cycle of sexual harm in my family. Um, the trauma we experienced a number of traumas throughout my childhood um, and I actually was fortunate enough to sort of join a, a survivors group that was being held by the Ahimsa Collective with Sonia Shaw and Megan Whelan. And a part of that survivors group was at the end of that group. Um, we got to actually go into prison, at, uh, to Valley State Prison, where I now work. Um, and we meet with um, offenders of sexual harm and offenders of other harm as well. But I was really looking forward to connecting with people who had committed sexual harm. Um, and so I named that my specific story sort of um, exists within a cycle of sexual harm. Um, so not just one person, but sexual harm being passed on um, through siblings, actually. Um, and I also named that uh, one of my brothers actually was incarcerated for sexual harm. Um, and even in with, with that background of where I was coming from, I still came to that meeting initially, I think, with this sort of binary approach of like, oh, I'm, I'm the victim and these are the offenders and we're about to have this exchange experience. Um, and very quickly things shifted for me and I was aware that I was actually sitting in a room of survivors um, and that this wasn't just a victim offender experience, if that makes sense, um, or exchange. Um, and I think this is something this question has been something that I've held for a really long time of who gets to claim survivor, who gets to, um, yeah, who gets support around that, especially as an offender, if you're incarcerated for it, um, your label is only offender, at least in my experience, um, and especially in my family, and what I witnessed. Um, and I think knowing, even as a young person, 
that my brothers were not going to get the support that they needed through the criminal justice system because of that label offender. Um, it pretty very like very quickly complicated for me this notion of victim and offender. Um, and I think what I'm finding also in my work is that this it's not always that easy. Um, and when we're not looking at someone who's committed harm in this sort of holistic way, um, I think the harm just continues. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and it's not about just being easy on people who have committed harm. I think it's about really addressing the roots of harm and how, how it is that someone has actually gotten to a place where they've been able to commit harm. Um, like, why did that happen? And when we're able to do that, we can actually stop the harm. And I think that's a huge part of the reason why I'm involved in this work. Um, and love so much going to the prison and working with these men. And sort of the last piece that I want to share, just checking on my time, um, is that in my experience too, I feel like I wanted to jump straight to sexual harm because in our society and what I've witnessed a lot of, it's sort of like the survivors of sexual harm or just sexual harm as a topic in general. It's so like, pushed away. It's the last thing that people want to talk about. Um, it's uncomfortable. Even when I share it with friends and family about the work that I do, the first question that I receive from people is, but what about the rapists? But what about the sex offenders? Um, and for, forget people who have committed murder, forget people and, and not actually, I'm not trying to say that there's <laughs> these different levels of harm, but I'm, I am trying to shed light on the fact that people who have committed sexual harm um, are so often not included in this conversation of, of survivors. Um, and I think it's, it's the place maybe that we need to start. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I might add a little bit after Kazu shares, but that's all for now. Thank you, Allison. Um, so I want to kind of continue to build on the the complexity that Allison just kind of opened us up with, um, and I'm gonna show a few slides. So give me one second here. I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Get a thumbs up for if you can see a blank white screen with nothing on it. Alright, cool. So um, this is uh, a picture of my friend Ant. Um, Ant was incarcerated in the San Bruno County jails about uh, eight years ago, maybe when I met him. And he was the in the first cohort of incarcerated men who became certified as trainers in Kingi and nonviolence, which is another curriculum that I teach that comes out of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. And he shared with me his story once that his first memory that he has of interactions with law enforcement is when he was about seven years old and it was right before Christmas. And the police raided his house and ripped open every single present that was underneath his tree because his father, his stepfather, was a suspected drug dealer. And they thought he was, he was hiding drugs in the presents. And that's his first recollection of, of any interaction with law enforcement. And from that moment on, he watched the police uh, take away and incarcerate his stepfather and abuse and harass his, his community. He grew up in, in, in an abusive household. Um, watched many of his friends get taken away and incarcerated and ultimately he was harassed, abused and incarcerated. And so when you start to hear Ant's story of his life, you kind of begin to, to understand that yes, Ant has done some things that have caused harm on other people. But like Allison was saying, this narrative of who's a victim and a survivor and who's a perpetrator of crime becomes much more complicated. One of the things that I really learned through doing these restorative justice circles with the HIMSA Collective and, and other organizations like the Insight Prison Project is that once you start to unpack and understand people's story, everything they do makes sense, right? It doesn't condone it. It doesn't make it right. But once you really hear people's stories and the traumas that they hold and the life experiences that they've had, you kind of get the sense of, oh, it makes sense why you did what you did. And I think that's so much of what restorative justice is about is understanding people's stories and, and, and uh, making the, the, the narrative more complicated than you're the victim and you're the perpetrator. Um, I have a friend who teaches indigenous studies at a local community college. And he says this thing that the black, white, right, wrong, 
one way or the other binary worldview is one of the most pervasive ways that our minds have been colonized by the state. That if we go back to any of our indigenous ways of thinking, we always understood that the world was nuanced and that it was never about one way or the other, black or white. And I think when we talk about harm, it is important to understand things like positionality and, and understanding uh, our, our position in, in power and privilege and things like that. Um, but it's interesting that so much of restorative justice comes out of these indigenous worldviews. And yet in a lot of restorative justice places, there's still this binary of these are the victims and these are the perpetrators and we're going to bring these people together. Um, and so I think it's really important that we begin to complexify, complexify this, um, especially when working in, in prisons where so many of these people who are incarcerated have lived through systems of violence for generations and generations. So how can you really say that someone is just a perpetrator? Um, the saying is very common in the field of restorative justice, right? Hurt people, hurt people. There's a, a beautiful definition of violence that comes from Marshall Rosenberg, who says that uh, violence is the tragic expression of unmet needs. That when we're feeling hurt and when we don't have healthy places to release that hurt, we hurt other people. But I think there's a flip side to this quote that I think is really important to remember, which is that hurting people hurts. Like I've worked with enough people who have caused great harm in society to see that as a human being, you can't cause harm on another human being and not have that affect you in some negative way. Um, you know, I do a lot of work around the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and, and years ago, King said that the civil rights movement was a movement for the bodies of black folks and the soul of white folks, because he acknowledged that being a white supremacist destroys your soul. Right. And I, and I think about the story that Ant told me about, um, you know, that experience that he had when he was a small child and how traumatizing that must have been for him. But then I also think about how traumatizing that experience must have been for the police officers whose job it is, is to go raid people's homes over Christmas and rip open prisons while there's a small child just sitting there crying, watching that, that that's not healthy for your soul. And so, you know, like I said, just working with these people on the inside who have caused great harm and seeing that the, the trauma that it caused them to have committed that harm really makes this complicated, right, about who's a survivor and who's a, who's a perpetrator. And I think so much of restorative justice is about acknowledging that violence hurts everybody, right? If you're if you're just even witnessing it, if you're perpetuating it, if you're victimized by it, it hurts everybody. And the Ahimsa Collective, the word Ahimsa comes from the, the Sanskrit word non-harm. And I think seeing only one side of who we are, whether it's just as a victim or just as a perpetrator, like only having one part of who we are acknowledged and not seeing all of who we are seen is a form of harm in and of itself. And with this idea that hurt people hurt people and hurting people hurts, I think the other part of that is that healed people heal people and healing people hurts. I've gotten so much of my own healing by going into these prisons and, and, and holding space for other men to heal. And I want folks to look at this image and think about who's getting more joy out of this interaction, the little boy or the duck, right? Things like healing, things like generosity, it's, it's an interaction where we're both receiving something out of it. And so even as a restorative justice facilitator, I don't see my role as going into these prisons and healing these men. You know, just in the same way that violence affects all people, healing affects all people. And I think that sort of healing, this sort of restorative justice process really allows people to become whole again, right? Because violence has a tendency to kind of separate people and separate ourselves. And I think so much of restorative justice work is about accountability. And I think one of the, the, the barriers to true accountability is that I think when people hurt and they don't get to have space for their hurt to be seen and acknowledged, then it's really hard for them to with the hurt that they may have caused other people. And so I think these types of restorative process that allow to really 
have their pain honored and have space for them to really hold themselves accountable for the harm that they caused really allows people to become whole again and, and become to kind of go back to their true selves and to come home again. So I think that's so much of the work of restorative justice is just com complexifying the narrative, understanding that violence hurts everybody and that also healing uh, heals everybody also. So I'll uh, stop right there for the time being and turn it back over to Allison to see if she has anything she wants to add. Thank you so much, Kazio. That was great. Um, I don't have much else to add other to, than to maybe reaffirm that we don't hurt people out of a void, right? That we don't, it doesn't come from nowhere. And I think for me, especially coming from a family where, as I said, it was a cycle of harm. I think the isolation that I experienced um, in myself because this narrative didn't exist or it wasn't told to me um, was really painful. And, and now doing this work and realizing like, oh, like the majority of, you know, we all exist within a cycle of harm. And, and what does it do to our, our souls as, as Kazu was sharing, like when we actually acknowledge the whole person and we acknowledge the whole system that you're sitting in, um, family system, cultural system, racial system, um, class system, um, and, and what that can do for all of our healing. And yeah, I just, I just want to reaffirm that. But thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from Richard. Um, thank you, Kazu and Allison, both for sharing. Um, just a wonderful opportunity to be able to um, discuss and, and contribute to this conversation. Um, you know, as I, as, I, as I was thinking about, you know, what I was going to say, I was just reminded of um, the friends that I lost to violence, right? Um, I'm thinking of my friend Sticks, my friend Chris, my brother from another mother, Steve, um, Mike Davis, I'm thinking about so many people that, you know, growing up in New York City, growing up in New Jersey, and just like kind of this nomadic space that uh, unfortunately we were left to deal with um, growing up. If everywhere we, we lived, there seemed to be a tremendous amount of violence um, in our communities. And as a result, we lost a lot of people. Um, and so when I, when I have an opportunity to share here, I just think about those lives. I think about the people who um, unfortunately didn't have an opportunity to have their stories be told, um, to understand the complexities of their lived experiences uh, to the extent that they could receive the healing um, support that they need. And I also come to you as, uh, to this conversation as a person who has um, harmed people by using violence. Um, and a person who's been harmed by violence, you know, so I've been responsible for hurting people and I've been responsible and I've been harmed by people um, as a result of violence. Um, and as, and, and ultimately, you know, that experience of being harmed and being hurt and hurting people um, and not having to, the access to the healing support that I needed um, at the time led to my incarceration. Um, and it was after a series of, of you know, decisions um, and, and things that I did um, going in and out of uh, um, jail from the age of 16 um, to the age of 21 in which the, uh, the judge in, ended up sentencing me to 10 years in prison, a decade. Um, and a few things happened to me um, during my incarceration. Um, the, the, the first thing, you know, I started acquiring a lot of knowledge and information about systemic oppression and racism and white supremacy and all of these factors that contribute to the conditions that we live in that produces this like type of uh, criminogenic uh, effect in our, in our communities. Um, but it wasn't, and, and that knowledge was very healing. And this is something that I'm recently just like, you know, talking about a lot, right? Like the, the multiple ways in which healing occurs. And so gaining this understanding of the social conditions that we live in and how that relates to our behaviors, one allows us to say there's nothing inherently wrong with me, right? There's some forces beyond my control, the control of other folks within our community that contributes heavily to the decisions that we make and the way that we interact and relate to each other and our worldview in general. Um, so that was healing to be able to say, hey, I'm not bad. Right? I'm not wicked. Um, but I think a really 
even more significant experience um, happened during my incarceration. Uh, I was at a, a Norfolk uh, correction, a Norfolk Department of Correction, uh, which was the same uh, the same prison that Malcolm X was in, um, and. Um, I used to facilitate, after I acquired all of this knowledge and was learning all of this stuff, we would share this information with one another. And this particular group that I was co-facilitating was one that was focused on um, family and helping the men who were incarcerated with me um, develop the skills that we needed, you know, start that healing process so that we can go home and be husbands, be brothers, be fathers, um, and just be a better version of ourselves. Um, and so we were really healing each other, supporting each other in this space. And it was this one evening um, that we were facilitating a group that a Latino man, um, you know, started talking about his experience. Um, and one of the things I would always say, like, regardless of what topic we have chosen for the night, if you have something that you're going through, please share, because at the end of the day, we're all that we have here in this space. And this Latino man started talking about um, his daughter being sexually abused by um, his um, child's mother's current boyfriend, and how every time he called home, um, his daughter would cry on the phone and tell him that, and it would just break his heart. Um, and the mom, you know, caught up in the cycle of things and dealing with home, home issues, um, kind of dismissed it, right, as unfortunately happens too often. And so here we are, a group of probably 40 men in this room um, hearing this story, you know, many of them had children. I didn't have children at the time. Um, and just hearing this story about, um, you know, how helpless and our inability to protect our children. And then hearing this young, this man tell this story, like had everyone's mouths wide open and you could hear a pin drop. And um, it wasn't until this, this gentleman by the name of, um, his name was Evolution. He was a guy who was inside. He was the largest guy in the group. He's probably about six foot seven and 300 pounds. He was, you know, had a reputation for being extremely violent on the streets. Um, and then out of the blue, he started talking about his own experiences of childhood sexual abuse. And he said, you know, I never shared this with anyone. But when I was this particular age, this happened to me. And I've never been the same since. And then he continued to describe his experience. And everyone was sitting there listening, perplexed, not knowing how to respond to it. Um, and then he said, I never felt normal unless, the only time that I felt normal was when I was aggressive or violent. And that's when it clicked for me. And I said, holy cow, I remember that. And that's when I started to reflect on my own childhood experiences of, of sexual abuse and how I also only felt normal when I was aggressive or violent. Um, and then this opened up a whole conversation about this topic. And eventually I posed a question to the rest of the group asking if any of them had also experienced similar situations. And out of that group of 40 plus people, everyone with the exception of one raised their hand and said that they had experienced it. And that was when I started to like realize that this was not a coincidence, right? That hurt people hurt people, right? And also that my experiences of, of, of violence and aggression was rooted in a more complex reality, more complex uh, series of experiences uh, that contributed to even that level of like depth and, and awareness of the fact that part of the reason why I felt like I needed to become aggressive and violent is because I had internalized Western notions of masculinity and manhood that said that, you know, um, the only way that I could affirm my identity as a man is to be aggressive and to be violent. And then if you couple that with the fact that, you know, child sexual abuse steals your identity before you can even form it, even as a child, I had developed this notion that I could not be vulnerable, I could not be weak. And therefore, if I was, even as a child, I was somewhat complicit in a process and I responded with this exaggerated sense of masculinity and excessive aggressiveness and a means and a feeble attempt to try to compensate for those fears and thoughts of being considered gay or effeminate. Uh, and so here I was in a room with, in a maximum security prison with all of these other men who had similar experiences. And that's when my healing journey began, realizing that it was rooted in something much deeper than I understood at the time, much deeper than the people around me understood. 
and were even able to support because they didn't understand it. And so, you know, after my release, I would commit myself to supporting the, the, the healing support, healing process of, of other people, openly sharing my experiences of my own childhood sexual abuse, um, how I, you know, struggled with my anger and my violence as a, you know, violence as a result of it. And so fast forward today um, at Common Justice, um, which is the, the first um, alternative to incarceration program in the country um, that uses restorative principles to um, support the healing process of both harmed parties and responsible parties. Um, it's the first um, alternative to incarceration program that serves uh, adults who have been charged with felonies, um, which is amazing because my experience um, as I was introduced to restorative justice, that most of the practices uh, uh, really focused on lower level nonviolent offenses. But the reality is that so many people who have been committed, committing violent offenses similar to myself um, experienced hurt and harm um, that was unaddressed and that trauma that was unaddressed contributed to their decisions and the way that they related and interacted and ultimately harmed other people. Um, and so at Common Justice, we provide you know, circles um, to support this process. And, and inevitably, um, it's always the decision of not only just the responsible party, but also the harm party. It's a process that's really uh, rigorous and it's really thought comprehensive that everyone must agree in this process. Um, and, you know, the other thing is that it's, it's, a, it's a process that um, it's survivor centered. And it's funny because we talk about survivor centered all the time. But oftentimes we never really hear the perspective and the opinion of, of survivors and our criminal justice system. Um, rarely do survivors have an opportunity to say what they would like. And one of the things that we determine in common justice is that when you give people an alternative to incarceration, um, to this punishment paradigm, people oftentimes, not actually always choose the alternative. It's the fact that they don't know any alternative outside of punishment and incarceration as a way to address their, their harm, their experiences of harm and then ultimately feel safe. And then we push this notion of accountability being associated with punishment, which is an illusion, right? Because I know firsthand serving my time that, you know, I could have spent every day, you know, 3,650 days of my incarceration um, in my cell doing everything but committing to the healing process that needs to happen, right? doing the work on myself that needed to happen so I wouldn't come out and be stuck with the same unaddressed trauma, right? And so we have this belief that punishment is accountability. Incarceration is the only alternative way to address issues of violence and hold people accountable. But punishment and incarceration is a very passive process. Accountability takes work, it takes effort, it takes atonement. Um, and all of the things that, you know, I was really fortunate to be able to to engage in and be a part of with other people who were also incarcerated with me during my time in prison. And it's also safety driven, right? We just think that there's this only way that you can make people feel safe is if you, if you lock people up. But the reality is like inevitably people are going to be returning to the community. Um, and so that's a misnomer as well. That's a, you know, that's a misconception as well, right? Um, people aren't safer with folks incarcerated because when people return home, if they have not been engaged in a process that's truly accountable, if they haven't engaged in a process that's truly healing to address that unaddressed trauma, they're gonna be left with the same issues and more likely to re repeat the same behaviors. Um, and then the final thing, the final principle um, that Common Justice incorporates in its alternative to incarceration program is, um, is um, that we believe that it needs to be uh, responses to violence need to be racially equitable. I mean, we all know the statistics about the disproportionate rate in which, you know, men of color and, and folks of color in general are, are arrested, convicted, and incarcerated, right? The excessive sentences uh, that they serve in, in comparison to their white counterparts, right? So we know we need to address racial equity head on. And so we, we ultimately strive to you know, create an alternative narrative and shift the narrative about how we view violence, how we respond to violence, and how we keep survivors at the center of any process that is supposed to be just and equitable and fair. And then I have the privilege of being the National Director of Healing Works. And Healing Works is a learning collaborative um, that, you know, it's interesting because it's this, 
Part of the reason why I decided to work for Common Justice and take on this role as the National Director of Healing Works is because one, um, it spoke to my own healing experience as well. Um, but at the same time, um, the approach to healing has its origin um, and then the evolution of Healing Works has its origin in such a hum humble collectivist perspective, right? So what happened is Daniel Serrett, who's the executive director of Common Justice, you know, realized that the majority of folks that she was working with in alternative to incarceration program were black men, men of color, and that we needed to figure out what was being done to help those folks heal. And so Healing Works um, really stemmed from this idea that she, as a white woman, should not be the person at the center of it, and it caused folks to, to look at who was already out in the community providing these healing services to boys and men of color who've been impacted by violence and trauma. Um, and so we pulled together all of these folks who have been committed to this, you know, this, this process of healing and restoration um, from George Gavis, from, you know, Communities United for Restorative Justice, Courage, and uh, Sammy Nunez from uh, Fathers and Families of San Joaquin, and Ramel Washington, who is a, is a clinician um, who's been providing all types of healing services to especially males who survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And Ramel was actually the person who named Healing Works It. So the reason why I bring this story up is because I think it exemplifies how we approach this um, from a collectivist perspective, realizing that we don't have the answers, but we can connect and we can help people come together who have the answers and create this space in which people can exchange information and knowledge and practices on what's the most effective to address the issues of, of trauma, violence in the lives of men of color and men of color. Um, and out of that, we, we pulled together what we call our um, Healing Works framework. And, you know, we did not create this framework. Again, this framework, um, which are uh, five tenets of it, and we are getting ready to include a, a, a sixth tenet, um, are derivative of those conversations, reaching out to those folks and saying what works. And those principles were, um, the principles are um, um, embracing self-leadership, realizing that folks who have been um, impacted by violence, young men of color who've been impacted by violence, um, need to be brought in and, and their leadership needs to be affirmed and they need to be positioned in a way um, that their stories, their narratives can inform their advocacy, their activism, and their own healing process. Um, we said we need to use uh, we determined that we need to use cultural and spiritual components in healing that are oftentimes non-traditional um, and that are really relevant to the, the holistic healing process of boys and men of color. Um, we said we need to address racial trauma head on, right? And realize that there's not only just this interpersonal experience of trauma and violence, but there's this historical trauma, there's this racial trauma that compounds the situation and exacerbates it to the extent that you know, it creates even more complexities on how men of color experience it. Um, and then we said ensuring a strength-based approach, not this deficit, deficit perspective that believes that once a person has been traumatized um, and experienced violence, that, you know, PTSD or complex traumatic stress disorder and all of its symptoms are just what we need to focus on as deficits. But how does what the person has experienced contributes to the strengths that they have, right? And, and becoming leaders and becoming healers themselves. You know, I wouldn't be able to do this here today if it weren't for the ways in which I was able to capitalize off of some of my experiences and utilize them as strengths and not deficits to support the healing process of others. And then finally, helping um, young men of color develop their skills and capacity um, so that those skills, those natural things that come from their experiences, their lived experiences, um, can be fully developed and fleshed out in a way um, that they can truly contribute to building this field, shifting this narrative, and ultimately building this movement, um, this healing movement with a focus on boys and men of color who've been impacted by violence. Because one of the things we know is that males of color are the most likely to be uh, impacted by violence, but the least likely to receive the services that they need. And we know that that's rooted in a historical view, a racist view um, that does not, you know, cannot hold the fact that men of color actually have been victims and are survivors, but are more likely to be perpetrators of violence and victimizers, right? And then the sixth tenet that we're introducing is this notion that we need to mutually heal. Because what we determined is that, you know, over the last few years, 
there's been this emergent of two like seemingly separate paths of healing when it comes to communities of color in which we focus on boys of color and then um, and men of color and then we focus on girls and women of color. But the reality is we can't heal in isolation. And so my healing is going to greatly contribute to the healing of my sister and vice versa. And so we realize that there needs to be a mutual and also a mutually supported healing process in cases in which we're not ready for that because a lot of damage has been done. And so we need to be very mindful of the fact that some folks are not ready, but we also need to be considerate of the fact that we need to heal together as a community. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it over to Jana. Say thank you again. Our, the insight um, that all three of you have brought, the vulnerability, can you all hear me? Yeah, I um, I really appreciate it. I did not um, uh, plan this conversation to build so much on the last webinar that we had just two weeks ago, which was about how can restorative justice contribute, um, how can it transform a culture of sexual harm? Um, but so many of the things that were brought up in this conversation build so much on that one, including kind of the relationship to um, surviving experiences of child sexual abuse, which um, was spoken spoken to um, in, in in with such insight and power, and from our own, for our personal experiences, this is also something that um, very much is part of my own experience as a survivor of of child sexual abuse as a child. Um, and so, and then at the same time as we're talking about about th those kinds of experiences of violence and harm. We're also talking about other kinds of experiences of violence and harm, including, as you all named, historical um, traumas, historical violence, structural violence, right? And um, gun violence. Uh, many of the, the boys and men um, of color that you work with, Richard, are also um, survivors of gun violence and, and, and a lot of other kinds of uh, gender-based violence, a lot of, a lot of different kinds of violence um, that, that we're talking about and other kinds of harm. So I wanna name that too. And I wanna name that one thing that we're doing in this conversation, I think, is both asking how do we both deepen and widen our conversation around um, survivors and, um, and, and that there might be some tensions in doing both of those at the same time. So for example, you know, um, Allison and Kazu, I think you begin to really kind of deepen our, our understanding of like, what do we mean by survivors in the sense of, Kind of uh, how does this victim offender binary that we often um, focus on in restorative justice how how do we need to kind of deepen our understanding of survivors so that we can push beyond that and at the same time I think you spoke to that so much Richard but at the same time what you're also calling us to do your work is kind of widen right our notion of survivors in a sense that so many boys and men of color have been impacted by both interpersonal um, violence and other kinds of violence and are not even recognized, even in the traditional ways that we define survivors and victims. They're not even recognized within that, so we're widening it at the same time. Um, so I just wanted to, um, you know, before we take some questions from our um, participants, just engage you all in some discussion, both give you a chance to respond to each other, and, and particularly Kazu and Allison, if you wanna to respond to some things that Richard shared, but also, you know, to ask you about you know, what do you think about the, the tensions and the contradictions of trying to do both of those things at the same time? I can jump in really quickly. Thank you so much, Johanna, and thank you, Richard. It was really amazing to hear you speak. And yeah, just, it's so nice for me to even be on a call with other survivors and just uh, to hear that you're doing this work in the world is really incredible, so thank you. I think I just wanted to touch uh, a little bit on what you were sharing, Richard, uh, uh, when you were incarcerated and you were sitting in that circle of men and that whole circle sort of named that they were all survivors of sexual abuse and how pervasive um, sexual harm is and how this the secrecy and the silence around sexual harm um is so is so deep and so wide that i think just 
how important it is for us to continue to name these experiences out loud and to acknowledge um, these experiences out loud by doing this webinar, by doing the work that we do. And, um, and, and I think what was particularly interesting to me and what I was hearing you say, Richard, and also in my own experience was that sexual harm is often at the root of so many of the harms that are committed. Um, and if we're not talking about it, we're actually missing a huge piece. Um, and I think stopping the harm. So that's all for now. Thank you. Yeah, and I also really appreciate everything that's been said and named and a couple of things that I want to build on that I heard from uh, Richard also that, you know, I think one of the the real heartbreaks for me in terms of how the criminal justice system operates is that once a harm has, has happened, the people that were directly impacted by it, victim, perpetrator, or whatever language you want to use, are complete bystanders to a process that is just railroads right past their needs. And so I think when we're talking about centering the needs of survivors, like creating these spaces, I know a lot of the men in, in our group in, in Valley State Prison, they came, one of the things that I've heard is like, I've been waiting 20 years for this group. Like even in prison, there is no space to talk about this stuff, especially when it comes to um, sexual harm and their experiences with that. So creating safe containers, safe spaces for people to be able to talk about their experiences with harm, I think is, is so rare in society. And I think especially in a culture like prison where you're told not to be vulnerable and that, that, that showing that vulnerability could actually put you, put you in danger, right? Um, and I also just want to name that there's a great irony in that, you know, in, in, in prison culture, people are taught not to talk about things that are vulnerable because it makes you look weak. But then in prison guard culture, there's that same culture, right? That where prison guards have no space to talk about um, vulnerabilities that may be coming up for them and, and what it might be like for them to have to, you know, commit harm as part of their jobs on people. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is working with uh, the Ahimsa Collective and some folks in Massachusetts in October, we're going to be doing some um, healing circles, a two-day healing circle for a group of correctional officers who are starting to do that work of saying, you know what, this work is traumatizing for us and we have some stuff that we need to talk about. And that kind of work is revolutionary too, right? And so creating space for people just to be able to talk about the things that are hurting them in a way that they can be honored and, and be seen for all of their experiences, I think is, is a revolutionary act. And I think, yeah, when we talk about centering the, the, the voice of survivors, we just need to create more and more of those containers. Um, yeah, um, you know, uh, I was talking to Kazu earlier about meeting George Gavis. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he said that drew me to him instantly is he said, you know, restorative justice is not a program, it's not a model, it's not an approach, it's a way of life. It's who we are, right? Like, it's just inherent in who we are. But it's fortunately, we've internalized this, like, punishment paradigm to the point that, you know, we, we acted out not only just in spaces in which, quote, unquote, crimes have been committed, or people have been harmed by violence, but we acted out in our personal lives and our families, right? So it really takes, like, a revolutionary effort to try to shift our perspective on what restoration looks like, right? Because, you know, I think about, you know, situations where a family member might piss me off or I feel I'm hurt and then I put them on punishment, you know, block them off Facebook, do all these things to, to make them pay because I think they hurt me, right? And that in itself is not restorative. And so one of the things he said to me, he says, you know, when people ask me about you know, restorative justice and they want to learn. And I, he says, the first thing I tell him is like, go practice it with your family. And when he said that, I was like, whoa, now that's serious. Like if you can incorporate this into the way that you interact and relate with the people who love you love and love you, but oftentimes hurt you because of their harm and their experiences, um, you know, it really helps to shift our perspective and our view on how we interact and how we can see the world um, void of this punishment paradigm that we just like, develop this fetish for. Um, and so I really appreciate the fact that, you know, just coming into this space, coming into this field, because I'm new in the quote unquote uh, victim services field, uh, survivor services field. Um, but to know that there are people throughout the country, and that's what's so amazing about 
about you know being at Common Justice and working with Healing Works because I get to interact and meet people throughout the country who are doing amazing work in spaces um, with young people, with older people, um, all over the place, and and people that no one ever considered were. Uh, redeemable, capable of transforming their behaviors, but it's like in those spaces, like so much magic happens. And so that's why I often brag about saying I have the best job in the world because my goal is to ultimately just make everyone as connected as possible and then let the world see it in this effort to build this movement to help people realize that there are alternatives to incarceration, there are alternatives to punishment. There's an opportunity for us to truly pack, uh, practice restoration and transformation. Um, as opposed to this punishment paradigm, so. Echoing the words someone just um, put in the, our Q&A, it has been such a rich, rich discussion um, already. And so um, I am going to um, just really jump in like uh, to some of the questions that have come in already, um, rather than commenting on some of the things that you all just shared. And I hope that that's okay. Um, can you all hear me? You can hear me okay? All right. So within, within this conversation, I can um, imagine, right, that some people are still, because of this dichotomy, is so ingrained, not only in most uh, understandings of restorative justice, but just in the Western kind of psyche, right? This dichotomy is so ingrained that it's been, it's it's very difficult um, to think beyond it. And some people, but they're still really grappling with it. I think we continue to grapple with that. And so I think this question in part, right, is in that context. So within the context of a restorative justice process, you know, do you have any practical advice for acknowledging the complexity in cycles of trauma and the blurred lines between the person who's responsible um, the, um, in, in a specific situation, um, the person who's been harmed in a specific situation in a way that still feels healing to the survivor um, of, of that specific harm, you know, who is understandably, right, requesting a survivor-centered process and might not be open to bring in acknowledgement of the harm um, of the person who, you know, the, in, um, was responsible for their harm, that person's background. And I would say too, any, so any practical advice? And also I would like to broaden that question a bit to say, do you have even um, any practical advice for those in our conversation who might be struggling with how much we've talked about um, people who are, um, who've been harmed but are now incarcerated, right? who some people really struggle with that. And I just wanna name that. And so any advice for, a, um, in the context of restorative justice process for acknowledging that complexity in a way that feels healing, but also um, any advice to those who are, still, who are also struggling in this conversation, even as we speak. Um, did you wanna say something, Allison? You sure? Um, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind, Johanna, is this, this you know, like when we talk about healing, um, I think we talk about it, I mean, obviously we know like healing is not, it's a journey, right? It's a process. It's not a situation, a place that we get to, even though I'm kind of hopeful that there, we have to get to a place to be kind of whole, all right? Because that's kind of like such a really depressing view that like once you've been harmed, once you've experienced something that you can never become whole. Um, but what I, I, what I wanted to contribute to uh, as a response is that, you know, healing is a really messy, ugly, difficult process. And it doesn't always look like we want it to look, right? It doesn't like, you know, it doesn't always, it doesn't always result in a person like hearing information, being in circles, and then getting to a place where they're not going to make some decisions as a result of harm, again, that hurts people. Um, it's not going to be a situation in which this person will just become a new, right? Sometimes they, they make mistakes. You know, when we think about healing, one of the things that, that we've been focusing on with our National Resource Center for Reaching Underserved Victims of Violence and the amazing group of experts that I get to work with in the field, like, you know, Lisa Wilson Good and Sam Simmons out of Minnesota and Dr. Derek Gordon and 
um, Tiffany Turner and Conan Harris, all of these people is like, we're trying to develop this, this holistic healing framework that accounts for um, all of the ways in which trauma impacts folks historically, um, interpersonally, um, state sanction, like violence and trauma, and then most importantly, developing a healing perspective that accounts for how healing looks in all of those different areas of a person's life, life right? How does organizing help someone heal? How does advocacy help someone heal, right? And we can't negate it. The fact is it does, right? But I believe, and I think we all are in consensus in the fact that we believe that none of those things can happen independently of each other. There are folks who are really engaged in this advocacy activist work and that are healing in a certain way. And then they might be neglecting like some of that interpersonal, like that emotional, spiritual stuff that needs to be a part of their healing process, right? Um, but I think, um, so we, we're striving to develop like this healing, holistic healing framework that accounts for the whole person and that process of making them become whole. But I think the, the what I really wanted to contribute to that question is that, um, is that um, healing is messy. Um, it, a person may start to process, person may fall back. Um, but I think the goal is that if a person takes three steps back, I mean, takes three steps forward and they take two steps back, at least we know that there's progress. And I think, unfortunately, oftentimes in our spaces and our organizations, um, we don't get credit for that. That's not valued, that that person still made one step forward and the last two steps that they took backward overshadow the progress that they made in that process of healing. And I think we need to really convey that um, perspective about healing and what it looks like um, so that people don't get demystified like in this process and believe that, you know, once this person goes through a circle, once this person hears this information, sees this therapist, they're going to be good. So. Thank you, Richard. Kazu, I want to add, you want to add on to that? Or yeah, there's two things. Different? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, there's two things that I wanted to add to that. I think one is, you know, one of the things that survivors need oftentimes or, or, or call for is accountability, right? And, and just a, a couple of things on accountability. I think accountability isn't something you can shove down someone's throat, right? Like there needs to be larger processes to like it, 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 part of accountability has to be that the person that caused the harm has to feel remorse for the impact of their actions. And if you're attacking that person, there's no space for, because they get defensive, right? Um, and I, I think it's also important to know that like your healing isn't dependent on their accountability, right? The, the goal of a restorative justice process is ultimately forgiveness and, and, and accountability that leads to reconciliation. But your individual healing isn't necessarily dependent on that person having their transformative experience. And I think it's really important to note that. And, um, you know, on a related note, I have a, a family member who is still kind of trying to heal from uh, an abusive relationship. And I was talking to her the other day and she was saying that, uh, unfortunately, she had a, she had a, a child with this man and, and is forced to go through uh, co-parenting classes together by the courts. And the person who's leading the co-parenting classes, not knowing any of their history and how serious and how violent it got, kept telling them, oh, you just need to forgive yourself for the, ben for, for the benefit of the child, as if it's that easy. And so she called me and she's like, what do you think? I'm being told that I just have to forgive him and move on for the benefit of my child. And what I told her was that I think for her to be able to forgive him after what he did and for the harm that he continues to cause today is like the equivalence of bench pressing 500 pounds, right? It's possible if you're a saint but bench pressing 500 pounds requires you to start with 50 pounds and work your way up. And so I think sometimes we try to move too quickly into forgiving someone who has hurt us the most. So maybe some practical things you can do is to think about someone who you're a little frustrated with that didn't hurt you as significantly and work on forgiving that person so you can build up the muscles of healing and the muscles of forgiveness so you can begin to slowly work on some larger traumas. So not to start with the person that hurt you the most. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kazu, for, for that insight as well. I think it's, it's really important what you're sharing. I just also wanted to, to add on to that question just a bit and also, I think this might even address some of the other questions that have come in. 
for example, around um, um, when it's not necessarily um, safe or helpful to bring people um, together, um, acknowledging the harm that has ha happened both um, more recently, but also the harm that's happened in the past, people are still in the process of healing from. And so one practice that um, has occurred um, in a kind of a similar model of justice or informed by a similar model of justice as restorative justice is that the creation of teams where you will have a couple of people um, accompanying the uh, survivor. This is actually a story that was just shared from our, our seminar that we just had last week as a, as a follow-up to our last webinar. A couple of people who are accompanying the, the, the person who survived that, that most recent situation and are really responsible for supporting that person's healing, finding out what their needs are, what their requests are. And then a couple of people who are accompanying and supporting the person responsible, right, who also has their own needs and their own healing journey. And so, and so by having different groups of people, right, you're not necessarily bringing them together to focus on um, um, all of those things at the same time, but you're able to, for example, bring to bring that the requests and um, and demands of the survivor to that specific situation, but also people are able to support the person's needs of the person who's been responsible for that harm, but also has their own um, healing journey that they're on as well. So that is um, a, just a particular uh, approach that that has been that has been used in some situations. Um, so we have a, a lot of questions that have come in. Um, so I'm going to get to as many of these questions as possible in the um, kind of 30 um, minutes, a little bit less that we have. And so um, I'm going to prioritize, we've got questions on a range of topics, but I'm going to prioritize the questions that have come in, particularly related to this question that kind of are grappling with uh, around survivors, around harm, those things. And if I have time for the others, then I'll, I'll definitely get to those as well. Um, so one question comes in, um, this, this, um, this question really speaks to what you all were talking about around um, historical harm, structural harms. How do we engage with the harm individuals have faced at the intersection of state-sponsored and historical sexual harm and violence? This is the, uh, a question for, um, how do we engage with the harm individuals have faced at the intersection of state-sponsored and historical sexual harm and violence? I can start and see what happens. Oh, Allison, would you wanna go? I can say something really quickly. Um, I think just that that's sometimes maybe where exactly where we need to start is by acknowledging um, that this this exists in, in a bigger context, that it's not just this individual um, experience. And I think even just to speak again personally, I think, and I hope I'm, I'm answering this question correctly, but even when I was a young person I, and I went to therapy, like just sitting in a therapy office was never supportive for me because it never took on this bigger understanding or the therapist never named that this is existing within generational harm, right? Like the, that even naming that I was Mexican American, even naming that I was a woman. And I think that was doing harm in itself and actually left me feeling pretty confused and it made me feel um, a lot of shame around who I was and what had happened. And I, and I think that I, I just want to maybe start with, we need to start there um, as a place of acknowledgement around uh, harm. I'll start out a couple of things too. Um, you know, one of the great joys I've had over the last couple of months is when we've been going into Valley State Prison, we've been talking, having explicit conversations about systems of patriarchy and how that has contributed to all these forms of violence. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to happen in individual and small group level about um, how we contribute to perpetuating these systems. But also, uh, I might have mentioned at the beginning, I'm currently in the middle of a five-day gathering of nonviolence trainers from around the country. That's kind of the other half of my life. And I think it's really important to, that we understand how these systems and these institutions oftentimes perpetuate these systems of violence over generations. And in addition to these kind of healing circles in the prisons and in communities, we need to be going out there to, to really organize to change these structures and systems. 
And I kind of see organizing in the streets as like the healing work that we do in the prisons just happening publicly while taking over a highway. Like it's still healing work. It's just trying to heal the wounds of society as opposed to healing the wounds of individuals. And I think we need to be doing all that at the same time. Yeah, I think um, is so, uh, you know, when I hear that question, I agree with Allison and cause of like, you, we have to start, we have to start from there. The reality is that um, in addition to holding individuals accountable, we need to hold states accountable um for the harm that has been imposed on communities and for me especially communities of color um we think about like the first instances of of state sanctioned violence and trauma um we think about the ma'afa and we think about the slave trade and we think about that initial traumatic experience that has been passed down epigenic, um, epigenic genetically uh, genetically from generation to generation and how that still lingers in our DNA and our bodies and we pass it on to each other. Like, and, and then we look at like the impact of mass incarceration as another collective, you know, uh, impact, uh, uh, traumatic impact on our communities. Uh, I, I think in addition to holding individuals accountable, we just, we have to think about how healing relates to holding other, holding the state accountable um, holding forces of oppression, those who were allowed, uh, who allowed uh, experiences of oppression to happen accountable um, and just recognize the role and the impact that that plays on an individual's process of healing. Um, because if we deny that, um, I think we're, we're taking away the, a, a major part of, uh, of that person's lived experience because sometimes, oftentimes, actually almost all the times, um, the, the initial traumatic experience we're facing, we're facing because we're black and brown um, and just have this, have this complexion that deems us less deserving of being treated fairly and, and, and just and equitably and, and then even just being deserving of, 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 of punishment and attacks on our community. So I don't think you can even think about healing a person individually without considering the impact of those other experiences of oppression and trauma that we've experienced. Thanks, Richard. One of the things I want to especially highlight from both you, um, Richard, and also that you said, uh, Kazu, and I think this also relates to quite a bit to what you said as well, Allison. You all, you all highlighted this concept of, of kind of what um, Africana Studies scholar Sean Ginwright, I think he's uh, based there in Oakland, calls radical healing, right? This, this idea of, of how our activism and our organizing to transform systems that harm us is a is uh, critical to our healing. And it also relates to what you said earlier, Richard, in terms of being able to name like the systemic causes of, of, of harm in our lives. And that is healing, being able to say, oh, this is not my individual problem. This is systemic, this is collective. And that is healing too. Um, so I thought that was really powerful. You all also talked about all of you in some ways kind of um, um, in some ways talking about other actors, particularly those related to the state. And we have a bunch of questions that came in around that. So I'm just gonna ask, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a few questions at one time that all revolves around, um, around kind of um, that area. So one of the questions um, was, it, do you have any practical tips for including police and our prosecutors in restorative, our healing circles, especially when the police and prosecutors are in part and whole viewed as, you know, the offenders in a particular situation. Um, someone else asked a question that is very similar, kind of talking about working with folks harmed by wrongful convictions um, and those affected by a, a systems failure. Um, and asking, you know, when thinking about victim and offender is, is what they do called restorative justice. They bring folks together that are terribly harmed. Um, Although, and I think, I'm not sure if this is saying the offender is, is not there. Um, and then another question similar that came in around the kind of the role of, um, of, of prosecutors and is speaking specifically, especially to the role of, of uh, district attorneys um, and getting them involved. And this question was especially directed toward you, Richard, in asking about how um, Common Justice came to collaborate um, with the Brooklyn district attorney. So some questions around police involvement, the involvement of prosecutors, involvement of the DA, and even um, kind of uh, thinking about um, 
when the state harms, particularly in relation to harmful convictions, anything you all want to say uh, about any of those questions would be really helpful for our, our, our guests. I mean, I don't have any of the answers in terms of getting law enforcement involved because I've been, I feel like I've been trying for many years and it hasn't been successful. <laughs> They're very resistant to this kind of work. There's a, the, there's a woman named Karen who works in Massachusetts who uh, has done a lot of this work and, and is the person that's kind of in charge of, of putting together the, the work that we're going to be doing in Massachusetts later on this year. Um, but I think a lot of it is just, you know, law enforcement officers know that their work is traumatic. Right. Like they see the suicide rates, they see the alcoholism rates, they see the, the divorce rates. It's, it's not an easy profession. So I think starting from a place of acknowledging their pain and, and, and letting them know that, like, we see that, too, that this work is ultimately for the benefit of everybody, um, as opposed to kind of putting on there like you all are the perpetrators of systems of violence. So you all need to come to do this work um, might be a one place to start. Um, as far as like the question related to common justice and how we were able to um, build a relationship with the district attorney, um, I would love to like talk more about that and connect with um, our executive director because I wasn't there um, when that process took place. But I would like to share the fact that, you know, since my arrival of common justice, um, and just in general, right, we're seeing like this, we're seeing like uh, this wave of really progressive district attorneys who are stepping up like um, uh, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia and um, state's attorney Kim Fox out of Chicago, out of uh, uh, Cook County, Chicago, and in, in Brooklyn, Eric Gonzalez, uh, the district attorney, um, who we work with. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's derived from this realization that um, you know, relying on punishment and incarceration is not effective. Um, it's not healing. Um, and I think uh, what, 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 what has to happen is we need to present them with alternatives that they can trust and they feel will uh, make people feel safe, realize that it's accountable in nature, um, that it's also survivor-centered, and um, and it's racially equitable. And I think when we're able to present alternatives to even district attorneys uh, that are already aware of the fact that, you know, mass incarceration does not work, um, punishment does not always work, um, and they'll, they'll be receptive. Um, and, I, and I just really like to highlight, you know, district attorneys like Larry Krasner in, in Philadelphia, Kim Fox, who's a state's attorney in Cook County, and Eric Gonzalez in Brooklyn as examples. Um, and so I think we are emerging uh, on a path of, of transformation within our court system um, that, you know, district attorneys are looking for, um, law enforcement are looking for alternatives that they can feel confident that will uh, help people heal um, and make people feel safe. So I hope that provides some, some help in that question, answering that question. Yeah. Um, Allison, anything you want to add, or should I just go ahead to so, so a few more questions? Okay. All right. So this this builds on what, what you all just said. So acknowledging, right, that we have a, an existing criminal legal system, and for many people, we don't have any other options, right, but to call on the criminal legal system when we're harmed, and so we have to work within that system. And then also acknowledging the fact that we know that um, this criminal legal system does uh, frequently um, escalate the situation. For example, calling the police can often frequently escalate a situation and don't necessarily um, uh, bring healing or lead to healing. And so um, this comment is actually coming from one of our guests and is asking about creative ways to compel a restorative justice process. Um, for example, in the case of sexual harm or sexual assault without the threat of, of punitive justice. And I also want to add on to that another question um, about 
um, speaking to those who want to bypass the healing pro can you speak to those who want to bypass the healing process who may be in positions of power and helping others but haven't recognized their own hurts and harm so these are two two different questions but i just wanted to bring them at the same time creative ways to compel a, a process without the threat of punitive justice and also those who are wanting to help others but haven't recognized the hurts and harms that they have done And Allison, do you want to start? Um, I mean, I, I think I just want to affirm the person who asked the, the question around um, how hard it is to call law enforcement in, in moments like that. I think especially when sexual harm or just violence is happening within our families, right? And not wanting to call the police or um, go through the criminal justice system um, because it, it messes with all of us, right? And we know inherently that it's not going to get us where we need. So I, I guess I just want to acknowledge the, that question and how important it is that we continue to, to figure out more ways to make this more accessible because ultimately this restorative justice process that I went through um, was so healing um, for me personally. And I know that its impact is, is, is bigger than just myself. So maybe I'll start the conversation there. I can jump in. I also, you know, there's one time where I had the experience of having to call the police, which led to the incarceration of one of my family members for several years. And it was a heartbreaking decision. And it was a, it was either that or loss of life for another family member. So it was like, it was the lesser of two evils. Um, and, and, and they are heartbreaking decisions. And I also want to acknowledge that in some cases there are alternatives, right? Like in, in that particular case, they were, my family was 3000 miles away. There was nothing I could do. But there are communities who are already building alternatives. Um, Creative Interventions is a great resource that kind of lists some of those alternatives. In the East Bay, we have the East Bay Transformative Collective or Transformative Justice Collective. So look to your community for the resources that people are already starting to build. Um, and also in terms of compelling people to these types of processes, I think hearing stories like Richard's, hearing stories like Allison, I think we need to spread these stories because people you know, for the most part, have no idea that this depth of level of healing is even possible, that it's even an option, right? Like, I had no idea what healing and accountability was until I started doing this work in the prisons. And so just sharing more of these stories about what is possible through this kind of work, I think will compel more and more people. Yeah, and I, um, you know, I want to add, uh, I have a friend, Whitney Richards, Calethis out of um, Sweet River. Um, and uh, I was fortunate to be at the Beyond the Bars conference and uh, facilitate a, a panel discussion talking about the relationship between restorative justice and transformative justice. And, you know, my understanding just from what I, I got from that conversation, especially from Whitney, is, you know, and that's where like this, the, the intersection of restorative justice and transformative justice be, right? Um, and engaging in this process of, of radical healing that Joanna was talking about, right? Um, and so one of the things that we, we've realized is that, you know, uh, through Healing Works, we've done a really good job of, of building this field, disseminating information and connecting people. Um, and so a lot of people have this knowledge that this stuff is happening. Um, they have this awareness of the need for healing. Um, but they also acknowledge that there are these, these systems uh, that pre pre present barriers um, that denies and that are not, um, that deny certain people the right to heal and especially black and brown folks. And so once you encounter this, right, you have this knowledge, what do you do next? And I think that's where transformative justice comes in because it creates a framework for us to start to look at transforming those systems, holding those systems accountable um, in a way that just transcends the individual experience, um, but also provides a sense of healing for individuals who have experienced um, um, oppression from those systems, but ultimately are committed to not only just their own individual healing, but um, transforming systems that can produce collective healing and radical healing, um, especially for, you know, communities of color, marginalized communities, uh, folks who have been overlooked um, in, our, in our society. So, Whitney, 
Richard Calictus, Sweet River. Reach out to her. She's dope. Yeah. <laughs> about those uh the resources i want to uh, i'm gonna have to touch base with you richard to find out more about that conference that sounds incredible and i definitely want to highlight the resources that have been generated by um movements working for transformative justice and community accountability that was also a theme that came out of our webinar uh two weeks ago and we also have a webinar on the Zare Institute website around transformative justice and some of the similarities um, and, and, and differences between transformative and justice and restorative justice but one of the things that is intrinsic to transformative justice is a commitment to working outside of the state and not engaging the criminal legal system and so therefore you'll find many more strategies for how to do that and uh, that emerge from that movement. Um, so just um, as we as we begin to wrap up, I want to throw in one more question. This actually question came in a little bit earlier on in our conversation, but I, so I want to make sure we get to it. But before I ask that question, I just want to share a few of the comments that have also been coming in related to different parts of our conversation. So one person um, shared about um, recently coming from a, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a uh, a circle participating in a circle of survivors of crime. Um, this person is a survivor. Um, they were um, incarcerated um, men who are part of this um, circle. And there was also DAs and prosecutors. It was sponsored by Restore Justice. And it was very powerful having DAs sit in circles hearing victims and survivors. So that was that um, comment. Someone also shared a comment earlier about um, uh, they've been working trying to get victim assistance funding equally to people of color as um as equal to um white folks in colorado victim assistance and the funding usually ceases when the criminal justice process is completed even though healing goes on for 10 20 30 years um and that overlaps with rj's they have an official rj program in the department of corrections this is in colorado so just so you all um know that there's just those are just a couple of the comments that have been coming in and um and last but not least um this last question so this person asks uh in in her work there's a large tension between um or in this person's work there's a large tension between folks imposing a survivor label for communities in the sex trade, so sex workers, and this narrative that all women, whether cisgender or transgender women, are deemed survivors of the sex trade, completely erasing their experiences and not considering root causes of economic vulnerabilities and so on. Yet a lot of sexual harm is happening and sex working communities are often labeled victim slash offender and criminalized, but systemically not much support structurally and systemically is happening. So they're wondering, you know, do you also see this in your work? And um, just wondering if you can speak speak to, to any part of that comment as we wrap up. And maybe it would be helpful for me to, uh, would it be helpful for me to, to reword it or restate? Or Richard, do you feel like you have a good idea of what the, what the person wants to know? Yeah, and I think, um, I think this is, is you know, what, what she, uh, she poses like really in alignment with what we were talking about earlier as, as far as like the complexities of, of our lived experiences, right? And like not looking at the last act or the last behavior, the last thing that someone's done um, or even things that people do, it's just like the sum total of, of you know, their experience and, and, uh, and really just looking at the complexities of who we are, right? And so, you know, no different for me, it's like it, it, it resembles um, the harm that I caused and, and people working with me, um, even though I was formerly incarcerated, um, but didn't know, like, the experience that I had of my own childhood sexual abuse and not being capable of like supporting me in that process and getting at those root causes. And I say that because, um, you know, uh, I call myself a wounded healer because I'm still healing and I'm still wounded. Um, and the reason why I say healing is messy because I still mess up <laughs> because I'm in this process of healing and, it, and if it wasn't for like some amazing support systems and people in my life who constantly 
um, show me compassion and love and understanding, um, you know, I, I, I probably would be nothing, you know? Um, and so I say that because um, it really takes people who understand that there's more to us than, than you know, the last act and the thing that we've done. Um, so, I, I mean, that's my take on it. It's kind of general, um, but I think it, 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 it just, it's just the case. It's difficult for people to see beyond what they see. And we have to start this dialogue and have this conversation and give people an opportunity, like Kazu said, uh, to tell their stories. Because what he said earlier, when people tell their stories, everything starts to make sense. And I think that's another instance in which if folks are giving them, are giving them platform um, from this, um, you know, who are sex workers or survivors of the sex trade, if they're given the platform to tell their stories, it will start to make sense. But I think that's the main thing that we need to do as those of us who are in positions of influence and, you know, somewhat power, um, is to make sure that when we have these opportunities to share, that we bring folks in. And this is a part of a, a bigger area that we're focusing on um, at Common Justice and Healing Works. And we're having our national uh, um, annual Paving the Way conference this Friday at Mega Evans. And it's really, we have a panel focusing on intersectionality and realizing that everyone needs to be at the table who's oftentimes voices are not heard. And I think that question kind of gets at the fact that um, this is just another instance and that um, folks from the, you know, from the sex trade need to be at the table and have their stories told so people can gain a better understanding of, of their experiences and support their healing process um, in depthly and not just superficially. I hope that helps. I think that that um, yeah, you spoke you spoke really well to that. Especially appreciate what you said at the end. And I'll just add a couple of resources also on add on to what you just said, Richard. Um, before and that, Allison, I see you wanting to. Is that are you, no? Okay, um, I'll just add a couple of resources. I was recently at a conference and I met um, someone who works at Freedom Network, and this is an organization that is working at the issue of human trafficking from a human rights perspective. So, and so not lumping all people engaged in the sex trade as kind of people that are engaged in human trafficking, which often happens in a lot of policies um, that are um, targeted toward human trafficking actually harm people involved in the sex trade who are sex workers. And so that's called Freedom Network, another organization that has since closed that, um, but they still have a lot of their resources online is the Young Women's Empowerment Project. The website's youarepriceless.org. And this was an organization of young women who um, were involved in the sex trade or, un or other kind of underground economies and did some really incredible work looking at their experiences, both kind of harm from the state, harm from um, like uh, social services organizations that they were supposed to be able to go to to get help but were denied those services um, because of various aspects of their identity, their involvement in the sex trade or LGBTQ identity, um, as young women of color, et cetera, and their intersections. And so those are a couple of just organizations that I would mention um, that might also be able to provide some insights on that question that you asked. Um, wow, we've covered a lot in a short amount of time. Um, and, and yeah, such a really incredible discussion, um, really powerful. And I'm excited about the, um, what this conversation will lead to, the connections that are coming from this webinar and the time we spent together. Um, and we're gonna close out now, um, but I wanna thank you, Allison. Um, Kazoo and Richard again, and I will also ask our guests to just, and, and our, our, our panelists and those joining in to, to stay with us for just a few more minutes as we take some announcements before we um, say goodbye for today. Hi everyone, my name is Michaela Waters Crittenden and I am a graduate student here at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I don't know how to make the camera work. Aha, I found it. So I'm the graduate assistant here for the Zare Institute and I just have a few announcements. So first our featured SPI course and SPI stands for our Summer Peace Building Institute is, I actually cannot see the name of the course. <laughs> Sorry guys, but okay. It's not popping up for me, but it's about center. Oh, hold on, Johanna has a comment. The, the course is called Sexual Harms, Changing the Narrative. 
And I was oh, yes. participating. So I hope you all will join me. Thank you, Johanna. So it's being taught May 24th through June 1st, and the instructor is Carolyn Stoffer. It's going to be taught as an intensive course. You can learn more and register at emu.edu slash cjp SPI courses. So STAR, otherwise known as our uh, Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience, is a research-based training program that brings together theory and practices from neurobiology, conflict transformation, human security, spirituality, and restorative justice in order to address the needs of trauma-impacted individuals and communities. This program is designed for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with populations dealing with current or historic trauma. If you're interested in STAR, please do visit the link at the bottom. So we offer a restorative justice graduate certificate that can be completed in 18 credit hours. And you can do the part of the courses through the school year and part of the courses through the Summer Peace Building Institute uh, or a combination of one of, those, both, one of those methods. And if you're interested in that, you can check the link down at the bottom. So restorative justice and education, uh, if you're interested in that intersection, we offer a master's in education with an RJE concentration. It's, and we also offer a 15 hour graduate certificate in restorative justice and education, and that can be used for a variety of professionals working in educational settings. We also offer a master's in conflict transformation. And along with that, this fall marks the beginning of CJP offering a master's degree in restorative justice. Uh, the curriculum is practice-based and it's ideal for individuals looking to be reflective practitioners within their chosen field. So last but not least, the Zara Institute is available as a source of upcoming events, resources, and schedules for our webinars that will be coming up in the fall. It's also a repository for past webinars that are linked to YouTube, and the recording for tonight's webinar will be available within the next 48 hours. That concludes all of my announcements. So here's Dr. Johanna Turner for some closing comments. Thank you, Michaela. And again, thank you, Allison. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Kazu, for being a part of this incredible and important conversation that will continue even beyond this webinar. I want to encourage. Um, it all, everybody really to share this conversation with others as Michaela said this is on our website it's recorded um, we want to, to really um, bring a, a richer and deeper um, thinking about what it means to be survivor centered and deal with the complexities of that into the restorative justice movement and one way we do that is by really sharing this conversation um, and so I just encourage everybody to do that and thank you again for the insights that you all brought and the personal stories you shared speaking from such a deep and personal place. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us in this webinar. And I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of the day, wherever you are in the world. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.